Hello and happy Memorial Day to all of you out there enjoying a long weekend in the States. For all of my UK listeners, happy Spring Bank Holiday? I'm not going to lie, that's possibly the least sexy way of saying long weekend that I've ever heard, but I digress. For everyone else, welcome to the last day of May. Today, we're actually going to take a bank holiday ourselves from the normal TNM timeline, but this doesn't mean that we're leaving you stranded with nothing to listen to. Quite the opposite, in fact. Today we have the pleasure of working with Kristen Robine Terpstra of the History Cash podcast. She's been gracious enough to allow us to download one of our favorite episodes from her show and highlight it here, and we think you're honestly going to love it. First off, it features one of the great female personages of all time, Olympias. If you're not familiar with her, well, don't worry, Kristen's going to get you up to speed. But as a quick introduction... Olympias is best known as being the mother of Alexander the Great and the wife to Philip II of Macedon. She's known for being an absolutely imposing figure and ruthless mother, as well as someone who enjoyed keeping snakes in her bed, because who doesn't keep snakes in their bed, am I right? All of that leads us to point number two, which is that Olympias is actually far more compelling than these simple anecdotes about her would lead people to believe. She was a complicated and fascinating person, and Kristen does a wonderful job of moving past the stereotypes to help us understand a little bit more about who the real Olympias may have been. And all of that leads me to Kristen. If you're not already listening to the History Cache, seriously, what are you waiting for? This lady can tell a story like no one else, and her ranges of topics are so varied that there's something available for everyone. Tribes in the Amazon rainforest? Check. Shackleton and Antarctic Exploration? Check. Multiple, real-life 20th century high stories? Check and check. All of this is to say that Kristen is standing by to tell you something that you may or may not already know. In either way, she's going to tell it to you in a way that will have you binging all of her episodes in short order. And, quite honestly, sad when you get to the end of her entire 43-episode catalog. With all of that as prologue, please, settle in and get ready to enjoy part one of Kristen's Olympias Trilogy. And when you're done, be sure to subscribe to History Cash to catch all the rest of the story. I'm going to stand to the side now and let my friend and fellow podcaster do the rest of the talking. Kristen, take it away. History has not been kind to the person who will star in this series. There are people who have impacted history to such a celebrated extent that though they lived for the blink of an eye thousands of years ago, they are still household names today that conjure immortal images of conquest, fame, and glory that still inspire. There are also people who have impacted history to an equal extent, although their names and deeds are obscured, forgotten, misinterpreted, and misrepresented so thoroughly that understanding just who they were is a massive undertaking. The woman Olympias lived almost 2,400 years ago. It's believed she was born around 373 BCE. Her lineage was an ancient and revered one, even in her day. It's not uncommon to look back at the houses of kings and queens and find claims of relationships to famous heroes, and even the divine, and the lineage of Olympias is no different. It was believed she was descended from Achilles, famous war hero of the Iliad, arguably the greatest warrior in Greek history. This very real belief of hers was passed down to her son, Alexander the Great. Alexander is described as having been obsessed with Achilles and the Iliad, even sleeping with it under his pillow at night. He carried a copy with him throughout his life, and Olympias is unquestionably the original source of this fascination. There is no doubt that Olympias was one of the greatest influences that would shape the man Alexander the Great eventually became. They corresponded continuously while he was out conquering the known world, and she helped manage his kingdom back in Macedonia, watching his back for the many pitfalls she saw waiting to swallow her son into oblivion. 
warning him of the dangers she believed were surrounding him, and she would be right. There are thousands of books written about Alexander the Great. There is a mountain of books and articles written about his father, Philip II. In the last 2,400 years, do you know how many academically researched non-fictional books that have Olympias as the primary subject? One. One. And I'm so thankful it exists because without it, this series would have been a nightmare to research. It's called Olympias, Mother of Alexander the Great, and was written by Dr. Elizabeth Carney, professor of ancient history at Clemson University. It was not an easy book to get, and it was the most expensive paperback book I have ever bought in my life. But it was worth it because Carney gives what is probably the most enlightened perspective of Olympias that the world has seen, ever. It took almost 2,400 years for a serious scholar to tell her story, so this book was a long time coming. The primary sources we have on Olympias are ancient, they are biased, and they all portray Olympias as a monster. Even the ones that have slightly appealing things to say on rare occasions, and even that's generous, peg Olympias as a vindictive, jealous, power-hungry despot with uncontrolled emotions who thrived on blood and cruel vengeance. And she was a witch. I've called this series Olympias, Witch of Epirus, Mother of Alexander the Great. But the witch part is meant to be tongue-in-cheek. She did have some interesting religious practices that shocked some people of her day. But the scholars that wrote of her, sometimes centuries after her death, would portray her as less of a priestess and more of a witch that worked spells and used drugs to curse and maim those she wanted out of her way. These ancient writers were not fans of women in power, so separating the facts from the sexist chaff isn't easy or even completely possible anymore since literally millennia have passed since everything went down. And if everything these authors wrote actually did take place, or if even half of it did, Olympias makes Circe Lannister look like Shirley Temple. This is not a nice story. It's violent, it's bloody, and it's epically complicated in the way most Greek tragedies are. So buckle up for this one, because we're going to ancient Greece, before it was even Greece. And we're going to meet Olympias, the most famous woman you've never heard of. I'm your host, Kristen Robine Terpstra, and this is the History Cache. Let's have a look inside. This is not a story about Alexander the Great. This is not a story about Philip II, but it would be impossible not to talk about them at some length because both of them were key players in the life of Olympias. The sources we have are biased and romanticized. The authors wrote sometimes centuries apart and centuries after the fall of Alexander's empire. This was at a time when bias was not a concern for researchers and historians. Complete accuracy doesn't seem to have been much of an issue, and much of what we have is blatantly propaganda. They wrote history in the way you would write a a based-on-a-true-story movie script. And the further we get from the actual events that took place, the less we can really trust our ancient authors to paint an accurate picture of things. Only Olympias knows why she did the things she did. We can infer our own ideas all day, and we have been doing so for a long time, but tragically, even the best attempt at a complete, totally accurate story like this series is, is futile to a degree. But I will work with what we do have to give you the best of it. This will probably be at least a three-part series. In this first episode, I'm going to set up the scene, describe who she was, who the main characters were, and give you an idea of what the world was like in ancient Greece. 
Most of the bloody action will be in the next episode, but this one will give you everything you need to know to understand exactly what happened and why. To understand Olympias, we need to give some context to the world she was living in. She was born in Melosia, a region of Epirus that touched borders with Macedonia. Her father was Neoptolemus, king of Melosia. It was believed that the rulers of Melosia were descended from the son of Achilles, also named Neoptolemus, or sometimes Pyrrhus. They also claimed relation to Priam, the Iliad's king of Troy. There was great pride taken in this lineage. It helped legitimize the rule of the Eosid dynasty, that's the dynasty of Olympias, in the eyes of everyone, and it helped shape the character and individual personalities of the Eosids. That includes Alexander, who took extreme pride in his descendants from Achilles, which he very much seemed to believe in. And that seems a bit egotistical, but think about it. If you had been told from birth that Batman had been an actual person, and that he was your great-great-great-grandfather, and that he weirdly had a kid with Wonder Woman, and that kid was your great-great-grandmother, and somehow everyone around you bought into all of it, wouldn't it give you a little bit more confidence? It would me. You might even start to believe you are invincible. Alexander was famous for furiously throwing himself into battle at the front, despite how incredibly dangerous and nearly suicidal it was to do so. And although he had a grand collection of battle scars to show for it, he didn't end up dying in battle, despite the insane odds. Where do you think that confidence came from? In such a violent world, a heroic lineage could give you the confidence you needed to survive. In her childhood, Olympias was known as Polyxena. This was a Trojan name and a nod to her mother's line tracing back to Troy. Olympias would have four names throughout her life, each either chosen or given to her to commemorate life changes and significant events. Olympias would be the name she would carry for most of her life, so that's the one I'll use when describing her for clarity's sake. These names are going to get confusing enough without me switching hers on you four times throughout this series. We call Olympias Greek, but there was no Greece then, in the way we know it today. The region was a collection of city-states like Athens and Sparta, many of which were rivals. Athens at the time was already democratic, but that was not the case in Melosia or in Macedonia. These were made up of mostly non-urban areas and were still tribal in many ways. Although it can be argued that Athens was ahead of Melosia in political theology, women had more freedom in Melosia. In Melosia, a woman could own her own property, act as a guardian for her children, and had no legal guardian of her own once she reached adulthood. Women could even receive grants of citizenship in Melosia and pass that on down to their children themselves. This was not the case in Athens. Women could own no property, they were not allowed to be educated, and could never hope to become a citizen. A male slave technically had more rights than a woman did in ancient Athens at this time. Olympias of Melosia, on the other hand, could probably read and write. She certainly corresponded with Alexander throughout his life, and even conducted some economic trade I'll discuss later. The world she grew up in was not a paradise for women, quite the opposite, but she was probably used to a lot more freedom than the women of similar status in Athens at the time. The Melosia Olympias grew up in was a landlocked kingdom in northwestern Greece, inside the region of Epirus. It was mountainous and rugged, so much so that accessing it from southern Greece was difficult, and only passable through traversing one of several mountain passes by way of Macedonia, and only that in the summer months. The steep landscape was not conducive to farming, so herding was more common. Pigs, goats, and cattle would have been a common sight, peppering the green hills and mountains. Melosia did not have the gentle Mediterranean climate of its southern neighbors. Rain and snow fell often, and in the summer, runoff from that mountain snow made traveling both dangerous and strenuous, 
and the mountains would have hidden more than just cliffs, rivers, and mercenaries. Wolves, bear, elk, deer, and wild boar all wound their way around the giant oak trees in the mountain passes. We have literary and artistic sources that depict lions as well. It was a wild place in comparison to other regions, and southern Greeks, like those in Athens, considered the Greeks in Epirus and Macedonia to be little more than uncivilized barbarians. The north was still tribal, had monarchies that were constantly warring and changing, and it was considered a backwater and not Hellenized like the regions in the south. The ancient histories didn't pay too much attention to Melosia, so we know very little compared with other regions. We know Melosia sided with Sparta in the Peloponnesian War, and we know an incursion by the Illyrians was repelled before Olympias' marriage. But aside from a few inscriptions here and there, and some passages that seem to contradict one another from ancient sources, we know very little about the Melosia the young Olympias called home. We can infer that royal life in Epirus was precarious. Kingship in Melosia was shaky at best. Melosians often recalled, expelled, and overthrew their kings. They would sometimes compel their kings to share the throne with other members of the dynasty. This was the case for Olympias' father. Her father, Neoptolemus, had three children that we know of. Her brother was named Alexander, which hopefully doesn't make things too confusing later. A lot of the characters in this story all have identical names, so I'll be sure to specify as I go. Olympias had a sister as well, named Troas. Her father shared the throne with his brother Arebus, and when her father died, Arebus ruled alone and married Olympias' sister Troas, which is pretty gross because he was her uncle. Incestuous marriages among royals definitely played a part in the monarchies of ancient Greece. We don't know if the kings of Melosia were polygamous, like the court of Philip II that Olympias would later marry into. We know almost nothing about the mother of Olympias, and there is terribly little about her childhood in Melosia, or anything about her from before her betrothal to Philip. But it's clear her identity as a Melosian and her connection with Achilles and the famous characters in his line were a continuous source of identity for Olympias throughout her lifetime and throughout the lives of her children. The kings of Melosia were war leaders more than anything else. Their power was checked by custom and governmental structure, consisting of chief magistrates that were chosen annually to represent the various Melosian tribes. We have evidence that kings conducted some religious ceremonies as well. Every year, the king or kings would exchange annual oaths with their people, promise to rule by accordance with custom and law, and the people would respond by promising to uphold the monarchy. A ritualistic sacrifice was then offered to Zeus. You know Zeus, king of the gods, usually depicted with a thunderbolt in his hand, ready to smite anyone and anything. This sacrifice to the king of the gods would have been done very ritualistically, and I'm going to describe now what this may have entailed, so if you're easily upset when it comes to harm to animals, this is your heads up. The animal selected for the annual sacrifice of the king was probably a steer, a cow, or a bull, because the sacrifice would have had to have been a meaningful one, since this involved a king and a promise between him and the people. According to an article from Learn Religions, the animal would have been washed and cleaned, most likely decorated with colorful ribbons, then led in a procession to the temple dedicated to Zeus. The altar for sacrifice was outside of the temple. The inside would have been reserved for the statue of Zeus. The animal, decorated in colors and probably confused, was led to the altar that would have water and barley seeds laid on top of it. A smaller animal would have been placed directly on the altar, but larger animals like bulls would have just been led and parked beside it. The people would throw barley seeds along the path. This would allow the onlookers to become participants in the ritual instead of mere onlookers. <laughs> 
The sacrifice was not meant to be a violent affair. Violence was not the point, and the animal and everyone else would have to be willing participants. To show that the animal was willing, water would be poured over its head, causing it to nod. This was considered to be the animal's acquiescence to its part in the sacrifice. Just then, the person performing the sacrifice would pull a knife that had been hidden in the barley and quickly cut the animal's throat. Steam from the hot blood meeting the cold Molossian air may have risen as the blood flowed down into a ritualistic receptacle. The entrails, most importantly the liver, would be examined to see whether or not Zeus had accepted the sacrifice. If the results were favorable, and what priest or priestess would have said it wasn't before their king on such a special day, the ritual would proceed into a feast. The animal would be roasted in pieces over an open flame upon the altar, allowing the aroma to rise up to Zeus. The pieces of meat would be distributed, while the bones, along with some fat, spices, and most likely wine, would be left to burn upon the altar. This was the portion allotted to the gods. Sacrifice was an important part of ancient Greek culture. It signaled significant events, devotion to the gods, and it was a community event that helped strengthen social ties and reaffirm social structure. The Greeks only sacrificed animals in their religious practices. Well, at least by the time of Olympias, there is very little evidence to suggest that human sacrifice was carried out by the ancient Greeks. But there is at least one body archaeologists have found that suggests that at least once human sacrifice may have been carried out. According to an article from the Smithsonian, in 2016, the body of a teenage boy was found deep inside of an ash pit on Mount Lycaon, the earliest known site for worship for the god Zeus. The boy's skeleton had been laid out in an east-west direction, with two lines of stones placed along his sides. Part of his skull was missing. So why is it believed that this boy who died 3,000 years ago could have been a victim of ancient human sacrifice? There are a few reasons. First, he was found at a ritualistic sacrificial site, an ash altar on Mount Lycaon. The site itself goes back 5,000 years, well before the first references we even have to Zeus, and it was a sacred place for Greeks. Archaeologists have been finding bones of sacrificed animals there for a while, as well as pottery shards. There's no doubt it was a place of sacrifice. This teenage boy is the only human ever found like this at a sacrificial Greek site, and no other bodies have been discovered there. This is not a place where a person would have been buried. It was not used as a cemetery, and stories of human sacrifice on the mountain are ancient. In the 2nd century AD, Pausianus, an ancient Greek writer and geographer, wrote of the tale of Lycaon, the first king of Arcadia. According to the myth, King Lycaon sacrificed one of his sons and served him to Zeus at a dinner party, just to show how much smarter he was than the gods. So, not father of the year. But Zeus was all-knowing, and so was not fooled. He was enraged at King Lycaon, and turned the king, with all of his other sons, into wolves. <laughs> Legend has it that this ill-fated dinner party began a horrifying tradition, where every year a boy would be slaughtered along with animals on the mountain. The meat of the child would be cooked along with the animal meat, and whoever was unlucky enough to eat the human flesh would be turned into a wolf themselves for nine years. If, during that nine years, they abstained from eating any human flesh, they were allowed to return to their human form. If not, they were doomed to roam the earth as a wolf forever. Oh.
Obviously, this story is apocryphal, but there may be some truth to the human sacrifice side of it. Only future archaeological evidence will tell us the rest of the story, and some archaeologists are still very skeptical. So we have to wait and see. If this boy was a ritualistic sacrifice, he was killed around 700 years before Olympias was born. There is zero evidence that human sacrifice was happening in Greece in Olympias' time, but the world was no safer for her than it had been for that young boy. By the time she left Melosia, she had seen the cruel violence that would define much of her life and understood how unstable the world she lived in was. She had experienced the precariousness of royal life that could end in moments at the blade of a rival when her father was forced to share the throne. She had lost her father, probably her mother too. She had seen her sister married to her uncle and survived the invasion of her country during an incursion of Illyrians. These are only the tragedies and uncertainties we know she experienced. There could certainly have been more. These alone were difficult circumstances to experience as a young girl, but they would forge the metal of Olympias. In Melosia, she developed the cunning mind, the strong character and sharp intelligence she would need for the rest of her life. Melosia made Olympias, and Olympias would by one means or another, change the world. I wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening to the History Cash podcast. There are over 700,000 podcasts to choose from now, and the fact that you chose to listen to mine today is astonishingly awesome. So I genuinely want to thank you for being here. I do this podcast because I want to make history both exciting and accessible to everyone. That's why I do this show for free. But the costs are accumulating. If you can, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash historycashpodcast. Patrons help me pay for things like books, hosting fees, and music licenses that add up way faster than you'd think. All patrons get free stickers, access to the members-only feed, and the benefits only increase with each tier. So if you love history and have a dollar a month to help out this nerd who wants to bring history to life again, check out Patreon. And if not, I still love you. Okay, back to the show. Macedonia would be the next place Olympias called home. Unlike the Melosia of her childhood, Macedonia was much more Hellenized. This just means that the mainstream Greek customs of the more southern regions were more prominent in Macedonia. However, the southern Greeks still considered Macedonia to be a largely wild place, and its people just as barbaric as those in Melosia. Macedonia was more populated than Melosia, had more mineral resources, and it had access to the coast, which put it inside a major grain route, as well as offered its people a wider variety of trade goods and services the sea and its merchants brought with it. Like Melosia, Macedonia was no stranger to violence. Both regions were basically buffer states, constantly fighting off incursions from Illyrian forces. The Illyrians were a collection of Indo-European tribes that lived in the northwestern Balkan Peninsula from about the middle of the Danube River to the Adriatic Sea, basically today's Albania and former Yugoslavia. The Illyrians were fierce warriors and were a real threat to the people of northern Greece for centuries. Macedonia had a much more violent history than Melosia, but its people had a greater loyalty to the monarchy. While the monarchy of Melosia would eventually fall and give way to a federal republic, Macedonia would continue to uphold a monarchy until it was finally conquered by Rome in 148 BCE. And at this time in Macedonia, as Olympias was reaching marriageable age, a rising star in the north was quickly gaining power, crushing opposition, and putting Macedonia on the map 
in a way that made even the Athenians take notice. In Macedonia, Philip II was making history. I said before that this is not his story, but it would be impossible not to mention both Philip and Alexander, so he will make an appearance in the story of Olympias, as she has for so long in his. Their destinies, for better or worse, were irrevocably intertwined. Philip was not born as an heir to the throne. He came to power in a moment of disaster for his people. The Illyrians had invaded once again and massacred the Macedonian army, along with their king, Perdiccas III, Philip's elder brother. This was not the first brother Philip had lost to violence. His eldest brother, Alexander II, was assassinated at a festival, which you'll see later is kind of ironic. Philip was the last of the six sons of Amintas III, and he came to the throne in 359 BCE at perhaps the worst time in Macedonia's history. The Illyrians were preparing for another invasion. The Paeonians, a tribe of Thraco-Illyrians, were ravaging the countryside in the north. Both the Thracians and the Athenians were preparing to invade, both with their own pretenders to the throne. Macedonia was continuously in crisis throughout history, but this time it was exceptionally bad. As Philip sat on his new throne, one he may never have intended to hold, it's doubtful many would have believed his country wasn't about to be partitioned, its pieces thrown to all the wolves attacking from every side. And if anyone else had been sitting on that throne, that's probably what would have happened. But the world had underestimated Philip. Within two years, he had thwarted both pretenders to the throne and decimated the armies that had intended to conquer him. He went from defensive to offensive, invading both Peonia, then Illyria, and took back the territory Macedonia had previously lost. This was done with a combination of political strategy. He bought some powerful friends, sealed the loyalty of even more through marriages and alliances, and by reinventing the Macedonian army. The Macedonian phalanx created by Philip was a nearly impenetrable military force that decimated opponents on the battlefield. It consisted of a close formation of soldiers, most put it at 16 soldiers deep, with some accounts at 32. The close compact formation was strong in itself, but what really made the Macedonian phalanx the most innovative military formation of its time was the invention of the sarissa. This was a long, heavy spear, 16 to 20 feet, or 5 to 6 meters long, weighing about 14 pounds, or 6.5 kilos. It was carried by traveling soldiers in two pieces for utility, then connected by a bronze tube, making it one long spear in battle. It had an incredibly sharp iron head, shaped like a long leaf with a bronze spike on the opposite end. This allowed a soldier to anchor their sarissa to the ground, halting an enemy charge. Soldiers in a phalanx would wield their sarissas in unison, which took both hands. The sarissas were extended in rows of overlapping spears, five rows deep. which made the phalanx undefeatable from the front. The length of these spears decimated enemy forces that consisted of hoplites with much shorter weapons that could not hope to reach past the sarissas. This allowed Philip's army to make the first strike in battle, and it was a deadly one. If somehow an enemy made it past the first row of sarissas, they still had four more equally sharp equally deadly rows to contend with. The only way to defeat a phalanx was to either break its formation or outflank it, and Philip's cavalry was there on the sides to ensure that didn't happen. Philip's military success and his improvement of the Macedonian army would be a necessity for the success of his son, Alexander. Without the base of success and military strength Philip carved out of a wrecked Macedonia, Alexander the Great would have had no chance in accomplishing what he inevitably would, 
no Philip would have meant no Alexander. In the 23 years of his reign, he would greatly increase the wealth and territory of Macedonia, bringing nearly the whole of Greece under his control. Through Philip, the backwater that had been Macedonia became the greatest military power in Greece. Philip's mind was the mind of a conqueror, and when he finally had Greece under his thumb, he wanted more. His eyes began glancing to the east and the tantalizing riches of the Persian Empire. But much would happen before his mind would even play with the idea of conquering anything outside of Greece. In the second year of his reign, Philip met Olympias, an event that would change the very foundation of his legacy. At the time of their betrothal, Olympias was probably somewhere around 18 years old, and maybe even younger. It was not uncommon for Greek women to be married at the tragically young age of 14, and we're not 100% sure how old she was because we don't have the year of her birth in stone, but near 18 is a safe estimation. Her name at the time had changed from Polyxena to Myrtali. This probably happened to commemorate some sort of religious experience. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what that entailed. Theories range from a coming-of-age ritual to a Samothracian ritual, or maybe something from a yet unidentified mystery cult. Religion would play a central part in the life of Olympias. Religion was one place where women could feel like they wielded some power in a world that did everything it could to make them feel powerless. Women served as priests, even in some of the most prominent cults in the city-states and care of the dead, such as preparation for burial and rites at the tombs, were the domain of women. Greek culture was generally supportive of women taking part in religious rites, and fathers and husbands were even required at times to pay expenses for women to participate in religious festivals and dedications. Royal women were given even more freedom with religion, and since it was impossible to separate Greek religion from Greek diplomacy, Olympias may have used her position in a cult to help her wield some power, even when Philip was alive. Philip and Olympias met at a place called Samothrace. Samothrace is an island in the northern Aegean Sea, mountainous and isolated. In the Iliad, Poseidon settled himself on a mountaintop there to watch the Trojan War unfold. At the time of Olympias, it was home to a mystery cult known as the Great Gods of Samothrace, and the remains of the temple there, where the cult practiced their rites, still lives on today, though only a crumbling stone skeleton of what it had once been. To clarify, a mystery cult was a way for Greeks to cultivate a more intense personal religious connection with a particular god or gods. It was not a requirement to join a mystery cult, but it was something many people opted to do out of devotion, and the rites carried out in the temples of these mystery cults are still largely unknown. Initiation was probably required for each one, and this is most likely how Olympias got her second name of Myrtali. The cult of the great gods of Samothrace was in fact so secretive that we have no idea about its members' activities. But we do know that both Olympias and Philip met for the first time on Samothrace as participants of this mystery cult. Plutarch, the Greek biographer, wrote of their meeting, and his account is greatly romanticized. He wrote that Philip fell in love with Olympias immediately and had to marry her on account of this great love at first sight. Even today, you will find sources that buy into this. But it is extremely unlikely that this was the case. Their meeting would not have been accidental. Philip was a rising star and taking the Greek world by storm. He already had several wives, all used to cement friendships and secure military alliances. Another war meant another wife. He did not marry for love, and it is extremely doubtful that Olympias had any choice about who she married. It's possible that the two of them had some feelings for one another. They were both young, virile, and she could have done worse. But their marriage was a business contract, not a love connection. The marriage, which may indeed have been initiated by Philip, 
was probably intended to cement a Molossian-Macedonian alliance to thwart the threat of invading Illyrians. Her uncle Aribus, who had been raising her since the death of her parents, would have jumped at the chance to use Olympias to form an alliance against the Illyrians. He had barely managed to keep the fierce warriors from taking Melosia, and with Philip at his back, the Illyrians would be much less inclined to invade it. It may have even been Philip's intention to eventually incorporate Melosia into Macedonia. The marriage was a war contract between two men, and the consent of Olympias was probably not even considered. She was Philip's fourth wife, and she wouldn't be the last. He would have seven in all. That's a lot even for a Macedonian king. Most Greeks did not practice polygamy, but it was not uncommon in the north. In fact, it was another reason the southern Greeks tended to think those in the north were more barbaric. Olympias would soon find herself in a place where women had less freedom than they did in Melosia, and she would be competing with three other women, and more later, for status and power. The one thing that could raise her above the others would be to give birth to an heir. Philip needed children if he were to set up a royal dynasty. He needed daughters to marry to allies and a son to secede him preferably more than one. He had been one of six boys, and it was not uncommon for multiple heirs to die from illness or end up skewered on the end of an enemy's spear. Olympias would give birth to a son, one that would conquer the known world of the Greeks. But Alexander was not Philip's first son. That was Aridaeus, a boy born of one of Philip's other wives, Philina of Larissa. But Aridaeus had a mental disability that seemed so severe, it prevented him from being considered as an heir to the throne. We don't know if this disability was something he was born with, or something that came about through an accident. We don't even have any real ideas about what it could have been, but we know that because of it, Aridaeus was not a threat to Alexander's eventual place on the throne. And from all accounts, Alexander was fond of Aridaeus, so there seemed to be no animosity between the two that we know of about succession. Plutarch blames the illness of Aridaeus on Olympias, which is no surprise, because he liked blaming her for everything bad that happens in everyone's story, and I'm not exaggerating. Olympias has been pegged as one of the most hateful, vindictive women in history, and this reputation given her by ancient writers like Plutarch stains the pages of history even today. I cannot even count how many times in this research I came across modern articles indicting Olympias with crimes that are totally speculative. Don't get me wrong, she probably did do some fairly heinous things that will come up later, but the list of crimes she is accused of by Plutarch is an obvious reaction to his own biases about women. Olympias was powerful, intelligent, and courageous in an era where women were told they should be none of those things. By breaking the norms of the day, she was challenging the patriarchal system's stark stereotypes about what a woman could be. If Olympias could exist as she did, it meant that those stereotypes were breakable and that women had more potential than the Greek culture of the time wanted to believe. That made ancient writers uncomfortable, because it meant that their notions about womanhood were fallible, and they hated her for it. That fear of this powerful woman, that attempt to undermine her intentions, still seeps through into academic and mainstream stories of her today. Again, if you want the fullest picture history has ever had of Olympias, read Elizabeth Carney's book. It was 2400 years in the making. So what could Olympias have done, according to Plutarch, to render poor Aridaeus harmless, clearing the way for her own son to take the throne? Pharmaca, the use of drugs or spells, or what we would call witchcraft. <laughs> I think in at least half of the episodes I've done for this podcast, someone somewhere has been accused of witchcraft. It is the go-to accusation people have been using to explain things they are afraid of while accusing their neighbors of things at the same time for literally millennia. 
But although I do not agree with Plutarch's accusation, I do see why he wondered. You see, Olympias did practice magic, at least in the way we would understand it. According to Carney, religion played a central role in the life of Olympias, and it did for Philip, too. The tombs of the elite in Macedonia were more elaborate and bigger than those elsewhere, suggesting an emphasis on the afterlife here more than in other parts of the Greek world. In Macedonia, the cult of Dionysus was incredibly popular, and it has long been believed that this cult was where Olympias put much of her attention. She may well have carried out sacrifices herself, and almost certainly had some supervisory role in the cult itself. So who was Dionysus? He appears on the scene of the Olympians later than other gods, and the story goes like this. Zeus, as he tended to do, seduced a mortal woman named Semele. According to the story, they were in love, and Semele became pregnant with Zeus's child. Zeus was so happy at the news that he told Semele he would give her anything she wished for, anything at all. What Semele wanted was to see Zeus in his true form. But the true form of Zeus was a thunderbolt. Seeing him in his true form would kill Salome, and Zeus begged her to reconsider, to choose anything else, telling her she could have anything she desired. But Hera, the wife of Zeus, had discovered the pregnancy, and out of jealousy convinced the young woman that if she really was devoted to Zeus and wanted to prove her love, she would demand he show her his true form. And Semele was naive, and so believed the goddess. She wanted to see the real Zeus, who she loved so much. And since he had promised, he had to comply. So he appeared to her as lightning. and she immediately was disintegrated. But somehow, her divine unborn child had survived. Zeus picked up his son and sewed him into his own thigh to protect him until he reached maturity. Thus, Dionysus was a god of two births. He was the god of fruitfulness, vegetation, wine, and ecstasy, Later in Rome, he would be known as Bacchus. The festivals of Dionysus involved a lot of wine, and his cults would indulge in drink, as wine was the very essence of Dionysus, and the drunkenness experienced was believed to be the god himself taking over the bodies of his initiates. The initiates were said to lapse into wild frenzies, drunk on the god in ecstatic displays. One thing that the cult of Dionysus is said to have employed was the use of snakes. Snakes appear in many of the sources we have on Olympias. Some say she imported them, kept them in her house, and even slept with them in her bed. Plutarch even describes her as introducing snakes into the rites of Dionysus, writing, quote, now Olympias, who, more than other women, strove after these inspirations and carried out these frenzies more barbarically, introduced to the celebrating groups great tame serpents who, often raising their heads from the ivy wreaths and sacred baskets or twining around the wands and garlands of the women, astonished or terrified the men." Unquote. Plutarch meant for this passage to portray the barbaric and inappropriate behavior of Olympias. But honestly, if this is true, and she used tame snakes in mysterious rituals that terrified and caused sensation, I think it sounds kind of badass. While Plutarch does tend to fabricate motive and fact all the time, we don't have any real reason to believe he's incorrect about Olympias keeping snakes. Archaeology has uncovered many votives that include the imagery of snakes, and in Epirus, Olympias' homeland, snakes were used in the cult of Apollo, so it isn't impossible that she would have been the one to import them and popularize them in the rites of Dionysus in Macedonia. Given her position as the wife of Philip, 
and her initiation into other mystery cults, she may well have done this. People are typically scared of snakes, even today. Back then, in an era where no anti-venom existed, it would have been no different. Her usage of snakes and her keeping them in her household would have given her an air of mystery, of power, and it would have been intimidating. There's no way to prove this, and this is just kind of my own thought. But a woman as calculating as Olympias may have even been pleased with how her snakes intimidated others. In a world where she had to survive on a level we cannot even truly understand, given her sex, the risks inherent in living in a monarchy that can change at any second, any respect she could have engendered through her role in religion would have been a beneficial extra buffer to ensure her own safety and her status at a court that may have housed at least some rivals. While her usage of snakes was religious, it was greatly expanded upon, probably by Alexander, and definitely by later writers, to infer that Olympias had, perhaps unwillingly, perhaps knowingly, shared her own bed with a god. Alexander the Great changed the world. His meteoric and astonishingly quick rise was unprecedented. We know it was the result of a mother who instilled in him his heroic lineage and paved the way for his success at court, as well as a father who had tempered his army with discipline, new technology, alliances, and brilliant military strategy. If Alexander the Great was a rocket, Philip II was the launching pad, and Olympias was the rocket fuel that propelled him to the stars. I honestly don't know if I made up that metaphor, or if I heard it from somewhere else. Either way, it's appropriate. But many of the people whose lives Alexander would change, whose governments he would overthrow, did not know he had been set up to accomplish what he did. So in order to explain his success, they had to make him a god. A theory it is disputed that he may have encouraged and even believed in himself. That debate has been going on for millennia. But where there's a god, there has to be a prophecy, and this situation had a couple of its own. Plutarch encourages this when he wrote that both Philip and Olympias had prophetic dreams of their future son. He claimed that Philip dreamt that he saw the seal of a lion on the womb of Olympias, signifying the importance of the unborn child. Plutarch wrote that Olympias dreamt of a loud burst of thunder, after which a lightning bolt struck her womb. I'm really getting a lot of use out of my lightning sound effect today. It was believed that the lightning was the god Zeus impregnating Olympias, meaning that Alexander was the son of Zeus, not Philip II, so his origins were divine, explaining his success to the world and sanctioning what he believed was his right to conquest. Plutarch wrote also that Philip was dismayed at seeing snakes in the bed of Olympias. While I totally understand that seeing snakes in the bed of your spouse would be disturbing, I would not like it. It later is inferred that Philip took this to mean that Alexander was the son of Zeus and not his own. It is also written, even by modern scholars, through platforms that usually are excellent sources, that Olympias herself told Alexander he was the son of Zeus and used this as a way to manipulate him, driving him away from Philip II. I even found one account saying Philip would divorce Olympias because of her infidelity with the god. I want to be clear that there is zero evidence that this is true. Zero. Though we can be fairly certain Olympias would have told Alexander of his relation to Achilles, since this was a real source of pride in her dynastic line, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that she ever claimed having slept with Zeus or that she told Alexander he was Zeus's son. The Zeus-Alexander connection could have been used as propaganda even during his reign. He may even have been the one to start the rumor, but we cannot blame this one on Olympias. Sorry, not sorry, Plutarch. We don't know much about the relationship between Philip and Olympias. We do know that she would become the most prominent woman at court and the most respected of Philip's wives. 
Not only that, she would become the most influential Greek woman in the world at the time, and would remain so until her death. Her success at court had much to do with the fact that, out of all of Philip's wives, and remember, there were seven of those by the end, Olympias was the only one to produce more than one child that we know of, and the only one to produce a viable heir that survived into adulthood. There is no denying how important giving Philip II a son that could succeed him would have been. She gave him a daughter, too. Her name was Cleopatra. We tend to associate the name Cleopatra with Egypt, but it is Greek in origin and was carried into Egyptian society later by the Ptolemaic dynasty that would grow out of Alexander the Great's reign. Kings needed sons in this era, preferably a lot of them but they also needed daughters they could use as political pawns to help cement alliances with foreign allies and smooth out relations with more hostile ones. Did Philip love Olympias? Did she love him? We don't know. Many sources would have us believe their relationship was always strained. But if this had been the case, it's doubtful she would have enjoyed the status at court that she did, and if Philip really did believe Alexander wasn't his son, he would not have treated him as heir to the throne. By the time Alexander was 16, it's obvious his father had begun to see him as his heir. When Philip left on campaign to secure more territory for Macedonia, he left Alexander in charge as regent. A pretty hefty task for a 16-year-old. Alexander was also given the best education possible for the time. Aristotle was even summoned from Athens to give Alexander an education. The Aristotle was his teacher. You don't do that for someone who you don't think is your son. So Philip's relationship with Olympias at this point doesn't seem to have been antagonistic, but we can't say it was loving. Philip had a lot of wives and probably had even more lovers, both male and female. His list of male lovers was potentially longer than his list of female lovers, and the men who became lovers of the king expected special favors, and catching the king's eye was a way to increase your prestige and status. This was not unusual. Male elites took other male lovers all throughout Greece, and we know of at least four Macedonian kings that had done the same. It's something that Alexander would probably also do. This was the norm. We don't know how Olympias felt about Philip's other marriages or his lovers, but it's possible she would not have taken any of it personally. Professor Elizabeth Carney describes this well when she writes, quote, It is unlikely that Olympias or any wife would have felt herself to be in competition with Philip's male lovers, and not implausible that she could have allied herself with one of his male lovers or former lovers. Sexual tensions were an intrinsic part of court intrigue, and Olympias had years to learn to cope with them." Unquote. So she was probably not hung up on the fact that Philip had male lovers. It was just a part of the royal world she lived in. At some point during their marriage, Olympias' younger brother, who was also named Alexander, came to Philip's court, probably as a youth. For the sake of making these names less confusing, I'm going to refer to him as Uncle Alex from now on, because he was the uncle of both Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, the brother-in-law of Philip and the brother of Olympias. I mentioned that drawing the eye of the king was something that could increase your status and gain you favor in the court of Macedonia, and this was the case for Uncle Alex. The writer Justin, Roman historian of the second century, is one of the ancient major sources we have on the court of Macedonia. He writes of how Philip invited Uncle Alex to court. Olympia's relationship with her brother was strong, and they would be a part of one another's lives until their deaths. When Uncle Alex arrived at court as a young man, Olympias's uncle Arebus, the one who had shared the throne with her father and arranged her marriage to Philip in the first place, was still king of Melosia. Olympias's homeland. We don't know the relationship Arebus had with his nieces and nephew, other than we know he married Olympias's sister. 
It is possible that Philip allowed Uncle Alex at his court at the urging of Olympias, or it may have been in Philip's plan all along to eventually replace Erebus, an older, more battle-ridden man who may have been less inclined to accept Philip's authority with the young and more easily moldable Uncle Alex, who would be grateful for Philip's favor. According to Justin, Philip and Uncle Alex, who, remember, is the brother of Olympias, began a sexual relationship. And this is possible. Philip would eventually exile Erebus and replace him with Uncle Alex, making the younger man king of Melosia. This could have been Philip's plan all along, even before his marriage to Olympias. Philip had a cunning mind, and men who garnered the king's sexual attention expected favor. And what greater favor could you get than a kingship? There is no way to know absolutely that Justin was correct about the sexual relationship between Philip and Uncle Alex, but the subsequent kingship of Melosia, Philip's affinity for young men, and the exile of Erebus certainly make a compelling case. In our world today, the idea of one's brother having a sexual relationship with one's spouse would be a horrendously painful thing to have to cope with. Olympias' family could easily have blown up the ratings of any modern daytime talk show. It was a mess if we look at it through our modern lenses. But we don't know how Olympias felt about the relationship. It's possible that it hurt, or she could have viewed it as something positive, as confirmation of the influence her family had and the prestige such a relationship would garner for her brother and her line. Her brother was given control of the throne her father had lost upon his death, and that could only be good news for her. And this is not the last we will hear of Uncle Alex. By this point in time, Olympias had changed her name from Myrtali to Olympias. There are a couple reasons this may have happened. One, it may have been to commemorate the victory of Philip's chariot team at a place called Olympia, or two, and this is the more likely scenario according to Carney, it could relate to another life and status change correlated to yet another mystery cult, specifically at the Macedonian festival commemorating the Olympian Zeus when her marriage to Philip was celebrated. During their marriage, Philip had become the most powerful man in Greece, solidifying the territory of Macedonia and taking the rest of the Greek world under his control. It was a bloody business and would cost him one of his eyes, as well as an injury that would cause him to walk permanently with a limp for the rest of his life. He was in his 40s now and on top of the Greek world, but he had no plans of slowing down. He wanted more. He had Greece. And now he wanted Persia. Persia at the time was the largest empire the world had ever known. Over 200 years before Alexander would rise, Cyrus the Great had taken the world by storm, transforming a collection of semi-nomadic tribes who raised sheep, goats, and cattle on the Iranian plateau into the Achaemenid Empire, conquering Media, Lydia, and Babylon. The Persian or Achaemenid Empire was the world's first superpower, and it stretched all the way from Europe's Balkan Peninsula, which today exists as Ukraine, Bulgaria, and Romania, to the Indus River Valley of northwest India, and all the way into Egypt, meaning it had territories on three different continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. It was massive, and Philip wanted it. To get it, he would organize his army, forge new alliances, and strengthen the ones he already had, something Philip usually did when he was looking to make new friends was to marry. He had done this six times already, and he announced he was now going to take a seventh wife. Any new wife in the court of Philip would have undoubtedly caused some concern for his current wives, as it meant the dynamics could shift. But by now, for Olympias, it was unlikely this news would have brought a great deal of stress, because any child of this new wife would be far too young to rival her already 20-year-old son, 
who had clearly been groomed for kingship since childhood. The young woman's name was Cleopatra Eurydice, which is unfortunate because Cleopatra is also the name of Olympias' daughter. So from now on, when I discuss Olympias' daughter, I'll call her Daughter Cleo, for clarity's sake. When I say Cleopatra, I'm talking specifically about Philip's new seventh wife. Now, because any child of Cleopatra's would not be a real contender for the throne for some years, this event should not have brought with it any real drama to speak of. But this was Greece, and everything was always complicated. Because with Cleopatra came a man named Atalus. He was Cleopatra's guardian, probably her uncle, and it was to strengthen his alliance with Philip that the two would be married. It was another business deal brokered between two men. We have no idea if the young Cleopatra even consented. We don't know much about Atalus, but we know two big things. One, he must have been an important ally to Philip, because his subsequent behavior would have gotten him killed otherwise. And two, he had a big mouth, one that was going to shake up the very foundation of Philip's dynasty. History, because of the biases of early historians, will blame Olympias for what happens next for thousands of years, but it is the direct actions and words of this man Atalus that ripped the world apart. Atalus and Cleopatra came to the court of Philip. Here, Atalus met a man named Pausanias of Orestes, who would, within a short span of time, change the course of history. Pausanias had been a lover of Philip's and was a noble of Macedonia. Trigger warning, I'm going to describe an incident involving the sexual assault of Pausanias. So if that's something you would have a difficult time hearing, fast forward a few minutes. Atalus threw a celebration, some sources say before the wedding, some say directly after. At this celebration, there was a lot of heavy drinking, and Atalus encouraged Pausanias to drink to excess. When he was inebriated beyond the point of being able to fight back, Atalus had his servants, apparently many of them, rape Pausanias. The sources describe this as an intentional, thought-out, and vengeance-driven crime organized by Cleopatra's uncle Atalus. He did this because Pausanias had somehow insulted another one of Philip's lovers that had some connection with Atalus. Pausanias was obviously humiliated. So he went to Philip and complained of the crime, asking his king, his former lover, to hold Atalus accountable for it. Although Philip was upset with Atalus, he chose not to reprimand him. Atalus was his new father-in-law, and whatever army or territory he controlled was important to Philip in his race to invade Asia, so much so that he allowed Atalus to get away with the organized gang rape of his nobleman. Remember, when a man engaged in a love affair with the king, he expected benefits and protection. Philip ignored the humiliation of Pausanias. To show his former lover some sort of consolation, he made Pausanias a Samatophylax one of seven highly distinguished bodyguards that consisted of nobles and high-ranking military officers, bodyguards to the king. The promotion was meant to appease Pausanias, and he did take the promotion. But as we will see, Pausanias did not forgive Philip for not acting on his behalf when he needed him most. The assault of Pausanias was the first grave mistake Attalus made. Not addressing it was Philip's. But Atalus was not done insulting people beloved of the king. Atalus was ambitious, and there is little doubt that he wanted to see someone of his own blood secede Philip on the throne, not Alexander. Through Cleopatra, Philip's newest wife, 
Attalus was no doubt hoping an airborne of his niece and the king would one day rise to power. The only way this could happen would be if Philip and Cleopatra had a son, and Alexander was then either denied the throne in favor of this new heir, or died before he could claim it for his own. Eridaeus, Alexander's older brother, was already no threat given his mental handicap, so the only thing between Italus and more power was Alexander. And if Philip and Alexander both were to die, what better ward could there be than this new baby's uncle? The ambitious, arrogant, and Macedonian Italus, safeguarding the throne for his baby nephew. And if anything happened to the child, well, perhaps Italus could just go ahead and keep the throne for himself. That conjecture is my own, but I don't think that a thought like that would not have played around in the mind of a man so brash as Italus. He already insulted one of Philip's nobles in a public and hugely dishonorable manner, and Philip did nothing. That tells us that Italus knew Philip needed him and felt he could get away with pushing the boundaries of bad behavior even further. And perhaps to display his own power over Philip's need for him, or maybe just because he wasn't someone who was used to being held accountable for his actions, he would continue to push these boundaries until it was too late to pull them back. I said before we don't know much about Italus or even his niece Cleopatra that had just become Philip's seventh wife. But we know they were both Macedonian. Olympias was Molossian, from Epirus. Generally, Macedonians liked kings that were descended from other Macedonians. Philip's own mother was probably not Macedonian, and Olympias certainly wasn't. But if Philip had a Macedonian child with a Macedonian woman, it's possible some would have seen that child as a more viable heir to the throne. When Philip married Cleopatra, there were, of course, celebrations. Greeks loved their festivals, and the marriage of a king would have made for an excellent reason to drink, socialize, make sacrifices, and enjoy the wealth Philip's campaigns had brought to the country. There was a symposium, or a banquet, held where Philip, Italus, Alexander, and all the male nobles of Macedonia came together to celebrate the wedding. Women were not invited to the symposium. Neither Olympias or Cleopatra were there on this famous, controversial, infamous night. But of course, Olympias would be blamed for what was about to happen, even though she wasn't there. You see, Plutarch wrote that Olympias was jealous of Philip's new wife, that she was vindictive and had been causing trouble since she learned of the new marriage. There is, once again, no evidence that this was the case. Philip had already taken two new wives after he married Olympias, and those had occurred without any significant drama surrounding them. Olympias had given birth to the son Philip had designated as his heir, and her marriage to Philip was not born out of love anyway, but out of political ties. Her son was grown, and any child of Cleopatra's would not have been seen as a threat that would eclipse her son. But it was easy for Plutarch to blame the fallout that was about to happen on Olympias, because a woman was an easy scapegoat, and he didn't want to blame the heroic Alexander, or the beloved Philip II. At this banquet, there was a lot of wine, and everyone was drinking to excess, including Philip. There are three surviving accounts of exactly what was said, and all differ in some way, so I'll give you a generalization that most agree on. At some point during the banquet, Attalus, that uncle of Cleopatra's, very loudly made a toast. In this toast, he boasted about the children Cleopatra would give to Philip, and said something along the lines of, Now Macedonia will have a legitimate heir to the throne. You can imagine the crickets in the room as everyone would have understood what that meant. This was an obvious insult to Alexander, one to call his very legitimacy to the throne into question. And he said it in front of every male noble in Macedonia, 
Alexander was enraged at just having been slighted by this man, called illegitimate, and Alexander, a man descended from Achilles, could not ignore such a public insult. He fired back something like, What do I look like to you, a bastard? And then he threw his wine cup right at Atalus. But Atalus would not apologize. According to a surviving account by Satyrus, Atalus even threw his own wine cup back at Alexander. So what was Philip to do? Was he going to demand Atalus apologize to his son and heir? Nope, he was far too drunk for that. Instead, he grabbed his sword and charged at his own son, but fell to the floor too drunk to make it more than a few paces. Alexander, furious at this point, was said to have then looked down at his father on the floor and say something to the effect of, This is the man that plans to cross into Asia and he can't even cross from one couch to the next? After that, Alexander left. Not just the room, but Macedonia. He took Olympias, sending her to the court of her brother, Uncle Alex, king of Melosia. And he himself went to the Illyrian territories. You remember the Illyrians, the ones Philip had been fighting for decades? The accounts differ as to exactly what happened and the exact words that were spoken, but two out of three say Philip attacked his own son. All three say Philip failed to defend him, and all three say Alexander left and took his mother with him. So there was Philip, king of Greece, ready to invade Asia. And now his heir was gone. The most powerful woman in Greece was gone, and he had an ass for a father-in-law. What made things more complicated was that Cleopatra was pregnant with Philip's child. Macedonia was once again inches away from chaos, and within a surprisingly short span of time, everyone involved in that chaos who had been at that banquet would be dead. That is where we are going to leave part one. I wanted so much to get just a little bit further so I could give you guys some of the bloody stuff, but to do that I would have had to make this episode even longer, and I want to spread out the info as evenly as I can. In two weeks' time, we will see what happens between Alexander and Philip, and we will see for the first time just how far Olympias was willing to go to protect her son's reputation. Heads up, she goes pretty far. In the meantime, feel free to get a hold of me at historycashpodcast at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram, and you can find me on Twitter at the handle at cashhistory. If you'd like to help support the show and help me keep up with hosting fees, books, and music licenses, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash historycashpodcast. And if you've already done so, I'm looking at you, Craig and Kara. You are freaking heroes of history. Like Achilles himself wouldn't even be good enough to make you a sandwich. And even if you're not a patron... Thank you for listening today and choosing this show out of the hundreds of thousands of others you could have chosen from. I genuinely appreciate that you've listened and given a part of your day to Olympias and this show. And until we meet again, dear wandering stars of time and legend, go make some history.